Hey everyone, this is Joe. This is pretty much a feedback episode, but before we begin, I'm just going to give you some updates about some stuff that's happening, and then we'll get to the feedbacks. We are giving away a set of fudge dice, and all you have to do, what you have to do is go listen to episode number 113 and listen to that, and that will tell you what to do. Next thing, I got an interesting email A company, I'm not going to name them, a company said, hey, we like your podcast and we would like to run ads on your podcast. And, you know, then they requested all our information, demographics, how many listens we have and all that fun stuff. I think if they knew how many listeners I had, they they wouldn't really be making the offer. But it was very nice of them and I appreciate it. But the product has nothing to do with gaming, has nothing to do with geekdom. The only reason I can think that they picked us is either A, it's just a mass mailing and they sent it out to everybody, or B, the product itself is very male-centric and they might figure gaming attracts a male audience and therefore it'd be a good fit. So I'm curious if any of you other podcasters got the same offer. <laughs> um And I haven't replied yet, but I'm going to very politely turn them down because, A, I don't really want to run ads. I don't need to run ads. And if I were to run ads, I'd want it to be something related to the hobby or at least adjacent to the hobby. And this product absolutely is not. While I appreciate the offer company, I'm going to politely decline. Uh, The next thing I want to talk about is Anchor. Anchor. Well, it's not Anchor anymore. It's Spotify for podcasters, Uh, you know, constant state of change. It's almost like a Google product, right? Nothing ever stays the same. Jason has already talked about it a little bit, right? They're doing away with their editing tools and they're switching over to Riverside. So when you leave me a message through Spotify slash Anchor, it shows up on their website. The way I would normally do it is I would download it there and I would use Audacity or Road Connect. But... With this new redesign, with this sending everyone over to Riverside, I don't know how to get those messages anymore. So I have a few today. And what I did was they're still available on the phone app. So on the phone app, I was able to download them to my phone and from there move them to my Google Drive and from Google Drive get it onto my computer. But man, that that's a hassle. I don't mind doing the work. I'm just afraid that... They're going to do away with those tools in the app on the phone, and I'm not going to know how to get those messages. So I am removing all references to leaving me feedback through the app. I mean, if you still know how to do it, go for it. If I get it, I'll play it. But I'm just afraid that that might disappear, and so I'm going to remove it. Yeah. On the gaming front, you know, one of the things I have planned to do in the future is to run a Traveler game with James and Keith and Heather. They've all been on the show before. A little while ago, they were like, oh, so when are we doing the game? When are we doing the game? When are we doing the game? I was feeling bad because I I put aside my prep for a bit because I was like, ah, this isn't going to happen. So, you know, I I rushed through and I finished my prep. I did all the work. I put their, their character sheets on nice character sheets I set up a Discord and I sent everything out to them. I was like, you know, you you really need equipment lists and we don't want to bog down playtime with everyone just doing a shopping thing. So here's the equipment list. Here's the price list for everything. You know how many credits you have because that was determined during character generation. Go ahead, buy your stuff. Let me know what you got. Then on top of that, Keith got a ship in his mustering out benefits. So that has a ship's locker. That's going to have things like vac suits and survival kits and, you know, maybe some medical equipment or drugs for the the infirmary on board the ship, the sick bay, whatever you want to call it. You should probably decide that as a group, but Keith gets the final say because it's his ship. And for that, you get like a quarter of a million credits because 
uh, ship's locker is usually just considered budget dust is the way I heard someone describe it once. You know, when you consider the price of the entire ship, that stuff, eh, don't worry about it. So, yeah, I, I did all that. Oh, I gave them deck plans, right? I told them what the mission was about, all this stuff, and crickets. I've heard nothing back since then. So, <laughs> I, I don't know. I find it a little frustrating. It's almost like, well, if you're doing the work, Joe, you know, come on, get to it. We want to do, we want to play this game. But now that it's on them to do some things, it's like, eh, it's not that important. <laughs> so uh, I don't know. Maybe I'll give them another week or two. If not, I'll, I'm going to switch the order and I'll go ahead with the Tunnels and Trolls game before um, the Traveler game. Anyway, uh, so seeing that we're talking about future stuff, I also thought I would tell you a bit about uh, what's coming up in future episodes. The day after tomorrow, Daniel from the Bandits Keep podcast is joining me and we are going to be recording a review about a game called legends of the ancient world that will probably be next week's episode and then uh james is going to be joining me for the follow-up for the last episode we did together and this one i'm calling uh making characters backwards which you know just a clever little play on words for the way he and i approach character creation differently after that, or maybe before that, I don't know the ordering, uh, there's going to be an episode called Too Much Color, which is based on an old blog post I wrote and inspired by a series of episodes that Evil Jeff is currently doing on Minions and Musins. By then, we should be in March, and so Valerie and I will sit down and we will do a uh, February media wrap-up. That was coming in the future. Let's get to the feedback. <laughs> From the United States of America. All right, so I'm doing this a little differently today. I have about 12 feedbacks to go through, and instead of doing each one independently, I'm going to kind of group them together by episode. And so, like, I'll play all the ones for an episode, and then I will respond to them as a group. I don't know if I'll be able to get through them all. If not, I'll split this into two episodes. All right, let's listen to the first one. The first one is from Jason. Jason is the host of the Nerds RPG Variety Cast. I'll have links to the show notes. It's a great podcast. You should be listening. And this, if you listen to the show regularly, you're going to say, hey, Joe, you've already played this message on another episode. But there's a reason. I promise you we'll get to that in a second. Here is that feedback. Hey, Pedantic Jason here. So I've got about 12 minutes left in the podcast. I probably should finish listening, but I don't want to forget to mention this because I'm driving. You mentioned Method 1, roll 3D6 down the line, but technically, actually, as I push up my glasses, when we look in the DMG, Method 1 is roll 46, drop the lowest, arrange as player desires. There's no 3D6 method. Uh, method 1 is in the original method, which I'm sure is how you're using it. The way od and started is the DM rolls 3D6 down the line. But method 1, as TSR has always defined it, is the DMG 46 down the line. Or, no, I'm sorry, 46 drop lowest, arrange to taste. I know what you meant, but I couldn't resist. Okay, back to the episode. All right, so Jason left that uh, feedback. I played it, and I said something along the lines of, yeah, of course, that is the way I meant it. You know, the, the 3D6 down the line, method one, as in what we did. And then I asked a question about... Oh, D&D, &D, because, you know, I have the original books, and I don't remember the bit about the DM rolling them. I asked a question about that, and I also said that those methods in the DMG are alternative methods. So, technically speaking, I was still right. <laughs> so, this is what Jason had to say to that. Hey, Jason here. Now that I'm back home, I wanted to respond to the comment about generating ability scores and D&D &D and AD&D. &D. So in the Advanced Dungeons & Dragons Player Handbook, page 9, in top right, we in that first paragraph, it says, 
that each ability score is determined by random number generation. The referee has several methods of how this random number generation should be accomplished, suggested to him or her in the Dungeon Master's Guide. The Dungeon Master will inform you as to which method you may use to determine your character's abilities. So, no, the player's handbook does not say roll 3d6. And then when we look in OD&D, you asked about the referee rolling the attributes for the players. This is page 10 of book one of OD&D. Uh, book one, of course, is Men and Magic. And on page 10 at the top of the page, we see, well, second paragraph, determination of character abilities. Prior to the character selection by players, it is necessary for the referee to roll three six-sided dice in order to rate as to each of the abilities and thus aid them in selecting a roll. So, yes, the referee does roll by the book in OD&D. Hey, Jason. Well, thank you very much for looking that up in, well, in both books for me. Yeah, the interesting thing about... OD&D is while I probably have read the whole thing, I haven't read it front to back in order. And so that paragraph skipped my head. Though amazingly enough, the line about, you know, where it talks about hit points and it says when you get low on hit points, whether or not there's any additional effects is up to the, the DM. That sticks in my head vividly. And so, yeah, there you go. And then, of course, you mentioned AD&D, where you mentioned out of the uh, player's handbook. So you're doubling down that I'm wrong, but I'm going to double back and <laughs> I'm going to win this, dang it, no matter what. <laughs> uh, I know we're only having some fun, but you said technically, actually. So I'm going to respond with technically, actually, actually. And I'm also going to push my glasses up upon my nose here. And you said, as TSR always defined it. Those were your exact words. In fact, let's play those again right now. But method one, as TSR has always defined it, is the DMG. 46 drop lowest, arranged to taste. Sadly, sir. Well, sad for you. I'm, I'm a bit happy for it. <laughs> Happily for me, sir. That is not the way that TSR always defined it. I will refer you to the Advanced Dungeons & Dragons Player's Handbook, 2nd Edition, revised in 1995. On page 18, it says, Method 1. Roll three six-sided dice, 3d6. The total shown on the dice is your character's strength ability score. Repeat this for dexterity, constitution, intelligence, wisdom, and charisma in that order. This method gives a range of scores from 3 to 18, with most results being in the 9 to 12 range. Only a few characters have high scores, 15 and above, so you should treasure these characters. And then it goes to talk about alternative dice rolling mechanics, and it gives methods 2 through 6. So, as TSR always defined it, well, no, we can't say that, but as TSR ultimately defined it, Method one is 3D6 in order down the line. <laughs> uh, this was fun, Jason. Thank you very much. And I, I know we're just having fun. Well, I know, I assume that you're just having fun, and I hope you realize that I'm just having fun with you, too. Also, that I won. <laughs> All right. Let's listen to our next message, also from Jason. Take it away, Jason. Hey, Joe, Jason here. Just listen to, I think, episode 110, your wrap-up episode, the most recent episode, where you played your theme music for the last time. So I kind of agree with Val, the AI version of the theme song, not a fan. Uh, prayer sent, by the way. Um, as far as metacurrency, you know, it's funny because I have horrible luck rolling dice. So I should be a big fan of metacurrency considering how poorly I roll, but, you know, what can you do? <laughs> as far as alibi call, so in the Army, when we would do a range, say a rifle range, they would go through the, the series, you know, shooters on the left ready, shooters on the, left, on the right ready, you know, stand by, 
fire and and you know they they do the course of fire and at the end of the course of fire they would allow for alibi fires meaning if there was a a problem and and one of the range masters felt that the shooter should get to reshoot because of a, a weapon malfunction or for whatever reason and and so the alibi fires on the left alibi fires on the right and then you clear the range but that's where that comes from so hope that helps i know that was long-winded <laughs> sorry about that and i i'm not sure why i think about only being able to get criticals by expending experience points i kind of like the idea that lucky thing happening without expending experience but I, I can definitely see the thought process behind it so i'm not sure curious to see what other people think about that hey jason thanks for that call just to be clear Valerie never said that she hated the AI theme. She never heard that one. Valerie said that she hated the original theme that I would played for you like the first year and a half, the one by Kevin McLeod. Just a clarification. It doesn't really mean anything. Um, meta currency, yeah, yeah we, we talked about it. You know, it, it's one of those things. You know, some people are going to like it. Some people aren't going to like it. It's a universal in life, right? Almost everything is like that. Uh, alibi fire, yeah, that's that's interesting. Not surprisingly, the procedure in the Air Force was pretty much the same, except like I'm going by the the last time I shot, which yeah, you know, a little while ago. Yeah, they they just don't say that. They just don't clear the range until everybody has fired, and then if there's any refires, they they don't call it out again. You know, you just have a instructor is what they call them, uh, there behind you. And he says, go ahead. And it's not until everyone has finished all the fires that they, they go ahead and clear the range. Did you have to shoot in your gas mask? I don't like that. Although we get to use the holographic sights for some of our shots, but not all of them. Eh, go figure. And finally, uh, critical only being able to... Yeah, I agree. The problem is Lucky 7 at its core only uses a 1D12. So if you don't say you have to buy it, that means a crit happens 1 out of 12 times. I think 1 out of 20 times is too often. Never mind 1 out of 12. And so and then that requires saying, okay, roll a, a confirmation die, kind of like they do in 3E. And I, I'm not a big fan of that either. And, and I don't know. And that's why that's why I waffle. I, I haven't come to a firm thought on this one way or the other. And uh, as for what other people think, we'll never know. You were the only person that responded to that one. Uh, thank you again, sir. So the next episode is episode number 111. I had three people calling for that. If they were uh, in the order that I'm going to play them. Daniel. He, Daniel is the host of the Bandits Keep podcast. So links for his show are in the show notes. And of course, uh, Jason. And then after Jason is Merck the Meek. Merck the Meek is another podcast. Uh, another good one. Nice short episodes. I like it a lot. And again, links will be in the show notes. So let's listen to all three of these episodes, uh, all three of these voicemails in order. Hey, Joe, Daniel calling in. I uh, just listened to your last episode about traveler um, creatures, monsters, animals, and uh, whatnot. Very cool. I like the system. You know, it's funny, you added that extra little bit with the bioluminescence and stuff, and I feel like that maybe is what is air quoting here, missing right from that. I think the system's really cool based on what you're, how you described it, but I could definitely see adding another table or at least a chance that you roll on another table for, you know, because you don't want every single creature to have something like that. But, you know, it turns out a lot of animals have special things, right? Skunk smell, uh, you know, now I won't go think of anything else, but you know what I'm saying. <laughs> Especially sea life. Sea life often has. So anyways, you, uh, you could add that an extra table for a chance of something cool if you want to not have to sit there and be creative. It's interesting how Traveler kind of expects you to pre-roll everything, right, even the number that are going to appear, because I guess, like you said, maybe it's meant to only happen one, one time. So that's pretty cool. It's, it's, I love listening and thinking about different philosophies of, uh, of how you know, different games think about encounters and whatnot. Very cool. Also, new music, very cool. I think that's it so far. If I think of anything else, I'll call back. Great show as always. I'll talk to you soon. Hey, Joe. Jason here. Just listened to your latest episode where you used Traveler to create a D&D &D monster. I kind of grew James. A hundred chitter wisps 
is much scarier than one 900-pound soft-shell crab. And I think a party probably would be more likely to run from 100 or 600 of these things than they would from a couple big ones. Just my thoughts. So it'd be, it'd be interesting to see how players react to it. I, I don't know how you're using swarms. I know in a lot of games, swarms automatically hit in the rules because there's so many of them. So that's something that would be interesting is if they auto hit. You know, just because there's so many and they swarm over you. Anyhow, really interesting process. Thank you for putting that episode up, and I will talk to you soon. Hey, Joe, this is Merck. I really enjoyed your last episode. I'm liking the new intro and outro music. I enjoyed your process of creating a D&D monster from the Traveler rules, I guess. And I can really see the merit of having a large breadth of uh, game experiences to draw inspiration from for these type of cross-pollinating ideas. And I certainly envy all y'all who have started in the 70s and 80s and have been able to accumulate the various games throughout the decades. It's just an experience I was not able to have, but I appreciate everyone else sharing their experiences, and uh, this method was pretty neat. I did look up a pseudo-scorpion and found that to be pretty terrifying. I would hate to have a hundred ticks the size of house cats coming at me with claws. That would be pretty horrendous. Yeah, very cool. Thanks for the episode. Take care. Thank you all, gentlemen. So, things I'm going to respond to. Daniel, be adding special things. Yeah, I find that those die rolls give you a good skeleton upon which to then add layers of something else. As for the bioluminescence, that's kind of a a thing for this planet, which is why that went, you know, like I said, I'm rolling this up for a traveler adventure. Maybe the one I talked about at the top of the episode. So bioluminescence is a thing for that planet. But yeah, I agree. You need to add special things. I also agree that not everything can be special because when everything is special, nothing is special. The whole pre-rolling mentality, I get it. I like it. It speeds up things at the game table. It's like um, one of the early things Jason asked is, do you pre-roll the treasure for a monster or do you roll it up after the players defeat it? And I said, definitely pre-roll it because it speeds things up. I even pre-roll random encounters. If I know I'm going to be doing like a D&D game, right, and you have a one in six chance per turn, I will roll up like 100 turns to know when the random encounters are going to happen and what they're going to be. That's useful because, you know, when you're going along in the dungeon and you're doing your things, you know, I just check off my turns every turn, and I can say, oh, ooh, in two turns, they're going to have a random encounter. That's interesting. Uh, you know, and kind of mentally prep for it. But in Traveler, I've talked about it before, and there's a thread for it on the play forums, so... By all means, people, check out the play forums, www.deckadrian.com slash boards. There's a thread on there where one of the things that Traveler says to do is to pre-roll the damage that it does. And, you know, you just record that as a total, say, 13. But the rest of the rules don't support that because in the game, taking a 13 as 661 is very different from taking a 13 as a 445, because in Traveler, each die that you take in damage comes off of a certain stat. You can say, okay, I'm going to take this die off of strength. I'm going to take this die off of endurance. I'm going to take this die off of dexterity. But if you just have a total of 13, you probably don't have any stat that's a 13. 13 is really high in Traveler. So that's like an instant kill type thing. Yeah, I I think pre-rolling actually doesn't work in that situation. I've talked about that before, and like I said, there's a thread. Um, As for the new music, thank you very much for liking it. Valerie likes it, although she thinks that uh, that Zoe's voice is kind of flat. Not flat as in off-key, but flat as in, you know, she just does this one note throughout the whole thing. Thanks for that. Uh, Jason, you said uh, that you think... A hundred of these are scarier than one huge one. Eh, maybe I think that's up to the person, but hey, that's fine. I like scary. 
Uh, you say that the players are more likely to run. Good. I, I like players running. Why you shouldn't have to stand and fight everything to the death. Running is good. And then you talk about how some games you swarm to mean they auto hit because there's so many of them. Is Savage Worlds like that? I don't know. Um, but in this case, no, I'm not using that like that. In this case, swarm is just a costume. It's like saying those skeletons are green. It has no real effect on anything. In this case, I'm just saying that it's really one monster. You know, the hundred Chitterwisps are just one swarm. And you, so you treat all hundred as just one. And when you get their last hit point, I'm using air quotes there, it's not that you've killed the last one, it's that you've broken up the swarm and now they're all going to skitter away type thing. Yeah, so it's cosmetic. It's There's no game mechanic behind it. It's cosmetic and narrative only. And then Merck, you also said you liked the new music. Thank you. <laughs> you said you looked up a pseudo scorpion. Yeah, I even had AI generating image. And you look on that episode, the episode art is what a uh, Chitta Wisp would look like. But yeah, cat side scooter scorpion uh, glowing blue. Uh, yeah, that would be a little freaky. Never mind, 400 of them. And then you, I, what I wrote down was game envy, um, that you envy those of us who grew up in the hobby and you wish that you were able to. I did listen to your episode. Actually, I've listened to all your episodes, but I did listen to your episode on your tragic gaming backstory. I enjoyed the episode. So, OK, so you didn't get to grow up with it, but all those games are there now. And if you like what you heard about Traveler, you can legally, legitimately download the three original core books for free from Drive Through RPG. Just look up the Traveler facsimile edition. Yeah, Mark Miller has it there for free. And you want to buy it print on demand for only 10 bucks. So you maybe you didn't get the chance to grow up with them, but there's nothing stopping you from looking backwards and uh, experiencing them. All right, so looking at my time here, recording time is at 40 minutes right now. I'll probably be able to chop some of that off, but I'm trying to keep these episodes shorter this year. Uh, what I'm going to do is I have uh, one, two, three, four more feedbacks. Those will form the backbone of next episode. And I'll probably get one or two in from this one. So that will probably be a full episode. And if not, I will probably throw in the too much color at the front end of that to make it its own episode. And I'll push the Legends of the Ancient World review out another week. So everyone, again, I thank you for very much for listening. I truly appreciate it. I cannot say with enough words how much I appreciate everyone that calls and leaves feedback. Like I said at the front of the episode, I'm not interested in doing ads. I'm not doing this for money. I'm doing this because I love gaming and I love talking about gaming. I love sharing the hobby with other people, either those who haven't gamed or, or just talking about gaming stuff with fellow gamers. Getting the feedback lets me know that other people are listening. It lets me have that conversation. It lets me know it's it's two ways. It's more than just watching the, the numbers on Spotify and say, oh, how many listeners do I have for this episode? So I really appreciate the feedback. But as much as I appreciate the feedback, I really, really appreciate everyone that listens. I mean, that's what matters the most is all you listeners. So even if you don't feel send feedback. Don't feel bad. Don't feel pressured. Although I would adore hearing from you. I mean, I notice that almost everybody that sends me feedback are fellow podcasters. And I think that's because we know how important that is to us as podcasters to, to know that we're listening to, to have that dialogue. I get not calling in, but you know, if you want to, don't feel bad. We're not going to mock you. Not going to do anything. If you want to, just want to do it in writing and have me read it. I love that. But even if you don't, you listen, and that's what I appreciate the most. Just listening to me every week and enjoying my content and coming back, and that's what means the world to me. And I truly appreciate it more than I can say. Having said all that, if you do want to leave feedback, 
Feel free to call the feedback line. It's 562-774-2278. That's 562-RPG-CAST. There are other methods or all the show notes. Until next week, happy gaming, happy life. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Dekihedron RPG Podcast. Please come back again to the Dekihedron RPG Podcast.